You're listening to China Manufacturing Decoded from the Sophie's Group. Hello and welcome to the China Manufacturing Decoded show. This is Renu Anjouran, I'd be your host today. And I'm joined by Andrew Armenovin. Hey, how are you doing, Andrew? Um, doing well, you, thank you. Good to be here yeah. again. Yeah, you've been on the show a few times. And this time you suggested an interesting topic, uh, how China has been moving, or at least a part of their, their suppliers, a part of their industry. And that's that's what we'll, we'll cover today. It's not all of Chinese manufacturing, but a part of the China manufacturing you know, industry has moved from poorly made in China to made with quality in China, right? And why do we say poorly made in China? Actually, that was the title of a book written by Paul Midler, I believe in 2008, just after the Mattel scandal and various quality, you know, very widespread, very publicized, you know, uh, types of uh, quality issues, you know, that were covered in the press in the US and everybody was thinking what's going on? You know, everybody is starting to have their products, you know, made in, in, in China. And then we have all these these scandals coming up. What What's wrong, right? I gave a book with the book and it was sort of a, you know, first account of his experiences as a sourcing agent in, let's say, I don't know, production manager for, you know, Western companies. Uh, and that 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 was quite quite interesting, and that really marked you know okay at that point a lot of the reasons you know China was in the news was hey there's some really bad stuff made there right and why and 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 the part of part part of what Paul Midler actually uh, exposed was it's not just the Chinese suppliers it's also the buyers that go there want a really really low price. And the Chinese suppliers will, you know, sort of play the game together with, with the buyers. And in the end, in general, the buyers uh, kind of lose the game uh, because it's they get the low price, but also get the really low quality and all the safety issues and whatever that can come with that. And it, it was it was good to see that, yeah, it's not just the suppliers, also the buyers, right? It's a bit more complicated. But anyway, so... The topic today is how how they are moving and how, how they have been moving from poorly made in China from the, from that that image you know like oh it's made in China you know it's not going to last I'm not even sure it's going to it's going to it's going to work at all you know to oh wow okay yeah it's made in China but wow you know that that's a great product which we hear you know here and there and it I think long term it is a trend a kind of Kind of agree with you, Andrew. So, you've been in the electronics industry, developing products and uh, following up on on, on production runs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sometimes in China with Chinese factories, sometimes in direct competition with Chinese factories, right? For what something like twenty five years. So uh, let's let's go into this, and first let's try to unpack why you see. Ch- you know, made in China products being higher quality and higher reliability than, say, you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago. What happened? What happened? Did you have some uh, some some clues that you can share with us? Yeah, uh, thanks for that little background. I, I recall that book, very interesting book. And, and I uh, started traveling to China well way way back about uh, I believe uh, late 80s uh, early 90s and I remember mm. barely uh, anyone spoke English I went to Chinese restaurant there and um, all the menus were in Chinese no pictures oh yeah it was very That's difficult right. to order anything I do I do recall thinking, how am I going to order something to eat? And uh, I just kind of closed my eyes and I said, this one. And the lady brought me a dish completely covered with hot red pepper. <laughs> you went to a Sichuan restaurant. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
And I was like, oh, oh, this is not what I was thinking. And she kind of took the chopstick and moved the, you know, some of that the hot pepper around and said, there's chicken under it. <laughs> and I just ate barely a little bit and went home, you know, went to sleep hungry. Uh, so uh, a lot has changed. I do recall the pollution was unbelievable when I went uh, to meeting there, mm. uh, fire meetings. Mm. Just across the street, you couldn't see the building. Uh, mm. At the time, you were landing from the airplane. You could see a like a tire around the, the city, like a huge donut-shaped black tar hanging over mm. the city. It was, it was really a different era, I, I recall. And, uh, you know, moving along, uh, come, you know, 2000 and so forth, when I started traveling more and more, I noticed a huge change, almost like, you know, almost annually. Like every year I went there, mm -hmm. it was like a different way. A, a lot of changes, noticeable changes, you know, street mm -hmm. lights and more cars, better cars. Before it was all bicycle, right? Remember? Mm -hmm. And uh, no, next mm -hmm. time you go, there's not many bicycles. Now you have more cars and and people are dressed differently. And you just, you just, you saw a lot more. And then I remember when I went to Shenzhen first time, it was like really... Uh, not many buildings, and all of a sudden, I come back uh, five years later. It's just like huge city, you know. Yeah. Uh, so the, the CBD exactly, exactly. And, stuff. and then the metro, and then the high speed trains, and so on. Yeah. That's right. So I remember the early days; they were doing a lot of copying of products. I remember I bought a watch for ten dollars, and uh, when I just got in the taxi. As soon as I tried to touch the knob on the watch, the knob just came out and basically <laughs> useless. <laughs> uh, so, and yeah, then you, you get what you paid for, right? Basically, <laughs> that's true. That's true. But what I mean, the quality of everything was just always not good oh, those yeah. days. But then mm -hmm. 10 years after, it was amazing. I do remember buying a shirt and, uh, and I was thinking, okay, well, $10 a shirt, not going to be that good. And to be honest, if it was if I if I was on the same size, I could still wear it. It's still very good shape. Products mm -hmm. are you know Im improved a lot. And I'm just wondering, you know, I was thinking about it. And I was thinking, well, what caused it? What what made uh, made in China, which was you know basically had a a, a cheap and and poor connot connotation, but here it is now. Um, maybe the perception has changed. Uh, maybe people are looking at it differently, and I thought it would be a good discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the way I see it is that there has always been this cheap, you know, uh, like really cheap and reliable products made really fast, you know, as cheap as possible that will break very fast and so on. Uh, in parallel with a higher quality, you know, um, set of, of, of productions. Um, and then over time, the share of that higher quality, you know, set of, like, let's say, better products has, has simply grown, but it has never fully replaced the really cheap, really crappy products. I, let me tell you, if you really, you really look in China, you will find some really crappy stuff. But the, the, I think the key question is... Okay, how come a lot of these sort of international, you know, level, and I'm not, you know, international like in um, generally acceptable by American and, and European and Australian customers, right? Let's say um, right. level of reliability and quality. How come it has nearly come, uh, you know, mainstream in a lot of product categories? And not all product categories. We'll talk about that later, uh, but. Right. You know how come what 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 happened? You know so what what what's your take on this? What what do you think happened? Well, you know, I, I mean, it's hard to tell for sure because you know we're not running the country. But I was thinking, perhaps the government has a lot of initiatives uh, that is causing or that is mandated uh, to basically improve the products. 
I was thinking maybe there is um, uh, some subs, uh, how do we say that this subsidies, uh, mm -hmm. the government is helping with some finances, perhaps they're pushing them with some laws. And, and I think <laughs> all of these could be helping, but then mm -hmm. aside from the government, the increased competition that they saw from Europeans like German cars and, and the great products from Japan, that kind of forced them probably to emphasize on quality. And I think that mm -hmm. I do recall uh, when I was traveling to China on behalf of my company, our goal mm -hmm. was to ensure quality, right? And mm -hmm. so we were teaching them, no, 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 you can't do it that way. You got to do it this way. Right. Uh, and they learned. They really yes. learned. Right. Yeah. Right. I don't believe in subsidies. I, I think the subsidies were predominantly geared at developing the capabilities of the uh, the manufacturing sector to make, you know, electric vehicles and batteries and high-speed trains and, and you know, things like that, that that were, you know, in the Made in China 2025 plan, for example, typically. Yes, but that means just developing the... Uh, the production capabilities, right? Not, right. not really uh, like teaching people, like uh, stopping factories from <laughs> making bad products. That's quite different, I think. It, it made them more efficient because it pushed them to automate more, to buy more, um, you know, high tech machinery. Yes. No, guess, Did that yes. help? Does that help with quality? Well, if it's well set and well maintained yeah sure but that, that i i don't see that as a as a key topic however what you just mentioned there is the buyer's role right in number one allocating the the business the orders to their better suppliers right rather than giving more business to the the worst suppliers and right. then continually teaching them Right, giving them feedback, uh, and not just in the, the form of learning, right? Because sometimes I'm sure your company also sent them <laughs> a debit note, a chargeback right. or, or, of some kind, right? So, exactly. oh, wow, you know, bad quality suddenly is very expensive. Hey, right. we got to be careful. Okay, uh, what should we do? And then you, have, if they don't really understand things, yeah, they would maybe put more inspectors and things like that. But then you also come in there and you send maybe supplier quality engineers or, you know, people like you go in there and say, well, that, you know, you got to get better process control. Uh, you can't buy this kind of material. Uh, you can't do this like this. You know, you got to get good quality at the source. And then they find out, well, actually, if you do that well, yeah, it's cheaper, right? So some of the the manufacturers in China, obviously, they, they understood that because, yeah, poor quality is quite expensive. So, <laughs> you know, well, that just cost me a BMW Series 5. Got to be careful. Oh, that just right. cost me a Porsche Cayenne. Well, oh, that's, oh, I can't buy, you know, two more apartments to make my wife happy this year. You know, I got to be careful <laughs> for next year. You know, that that's really what they pay attention to, these guys, you know, very often, these uh, private entrepreneurs right because here we're talking about private sector right you're not talking about state-owned enterprises are you <laughs> yeah it's i mean different. you're right we're we're talking about uh everything that can be affected or, or did get affected uh, at the time i mean uh, you, you brought up a good point about the uh, focus on automation i think that um they they probably did a lot of focus on R R and D automation um key areas that uh, in terms of quality standards yes. that they need to focus, they need to um, improve and get in par, for example, with U.S. standards, you know, and uh, European standards yeah. in terms of regulatory and compliance. And all mm. of this kind of forced them to uh, improve the domestic products. And maybe even I think I, I saw a lot in some of the, Chinese shows, they were doing a lot of internal domestic competitions like brands or products that they were making. And I think that these kind of things helped companies mm -hmm. to Maybe. improve, mm -hmm. and to be in order to be in, in the spotlight and mm -hmm. not only in, in the spotlight to, to kind of promote their product, but also 
mm. promote uh, the fact that they are improving. Um, so I think yeah, all of that plus the global rivalry, right, between Europe, US, and China and Japan and Germany, all of these push them to a point where, uh, of course, I've heard a lot of other political things, you know, the, the government really kind of, you know, kind of pushed the, the people in the companies uh, to be number one in everything. Annually, every one of us watched mm. uh, uh, Olympics games, right? And, <laughs> and it was always Russia, China, and US, number one. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There might be some of that. I mean, it has become an extremely competitive market in many categories. The the most competitive market in the world, right? Especially consumer electronics. <laughs> There's a lot of products made yes, here, sure. just just for sale here, and then if they can sell some more, some other countries, okay, great. But they don't want to bother uh, going with you know. All the all the trouble of all the testing and everything for putting the CE marking and sending to Europe and and so on. They're just happy with the, their enormous domestic market. They go fast and then they have the next version, the next flavor of it. You know, in in two months and then oh okay, there's some Indian guys want to buy some and so whatever. Some some guys in some part of Africa they want some and so okay yeah yeah no problem. You know we'll sell you some, but. A lot of these products, they, uh, yeah, they're just sold in 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 China and maybe neighboring countries. It's uh, so more competition. Also means, hey, we get to find ways to be to be better. And if you're too crappy now with social media, including in China, well, that that's not going to help, right? The role of the the foreign buyers that had their quality standard and that that explained to these manufacturers, hey, this is what you need to do, otherwise we can't do business with you, and this is what it costs you to make a mistake. You know, I think that right. has been pivotal, and that's been going on since yeah, since the 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 nineties. You know, I think that has had a, a tremendous effect, and it's not the same in every product category. Okay, in right. some product categories. The buyers do not do that. And the buyers are predominantly focused on price. If you look at like uh, cheap underwear and uh, shoes, you know, cheap footwear, right? This kind of stuff you know, on these markets, and I'm talking the, the low end, right, of the, the footwear market, for example, or the, the uh, underwear market. It, it, Actually, what you could buy 15 years ago in China was better than what you can buy now. Now you can, you see that the buyers, and I'm talking, you know, in discount stores in uh, in Europe, for example, what they're buying now, they would not have purchased 15 years ago. They would have said, ah, this is not acceptable quality. This is no good. However, wow. these people are just so focused on price. And then, oh, there's inflation, there's everything, but our buyers still expect to pay that for whatever, you know, five euros, no more. And right. that's it. We just need to buy it for, you know, a price that allows us to sell it for five euros. And then when you get that, you have the word, like you have buyers actually driving poor quality and preventing the suppliers from going up, uh, up market at all, right? Um, right. So that's, that's one extreme. <clears throat> and then you have a lot of other markets where the buyer says, no, 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 quality standard is this. It's non-negotiable. That's it. You know, we'll work with the price. Maybe if if the cost is too high, we'll maybe remove a feature or something of the product. But quality and reliability are non-negotiable, right? And that's, you worked a lot on mobile phones. And I guess that's the, the general approach of the mobile phone brands, right? Right. You mentioned something about the, uh, you know, the, the the buyers and supply chain. Uh, I think that's a really good topic because that's going to going into supply chain optimization that right now even affecting our world with what's happening with the geopolitical situation. But I remember when I used to travel to China those days. Uh, <clears throat> 
we used to discuss transparency and traceability in the production line. We ensured that if you don't have transparency, if we don't know what's happening, oh, yeah. we're going to cut the ties. And we need to know, tra- we need to have trans- tra- what, what we call trans- traceability. We need to know exactly where you bought mm-hmm. this component, mm-hmm. where did it go? And we need to have part number for everything. We need to have a computer system that tracks and traces everything to component level. Uh, I remember these things are something very important to us, you know, in the West. And, and I think they picked mm-hmm. up on these things. Uh, for example, multi-layer management of, you know, the whole entire system level product, set and clear uh, quality standards, you know, for example, auditing, performance monitoring of the sub-suppliers, yeah. going yeah. there and see what they're doing. I mean, these are important stuff that I don't think they knew that until we went there and said, look, have you done any supplier audits? And they said, no. I said, well, we need to do it. Can you schedule yeah. it for tomorrow or this week? Right. We kind of pushed them. I remember at the time when I worked for Nokia, uh, I know that kind of shows my age, but uh, uh, <laughs> when yeah, I... Yeah, worked, mobile phones. Yeah, that, that was why. <laughs> that's, right. <laughs> that's right. That's uh, right. Nokia used to be like Apple, right? So uh, everywhere you went, like in Beijing, right around the uh, Nokia factory, there were like 500 or more supplier base, you know, that were supporting Nokia at the time. And so it was easy just to go uh, to Nokia factory and then contact a supplier and say, hey, uh, I want to come there and audit you right now. And half the time they wouldn't mind, but sometimes they would buy a day. All of a sudden they would say, oh, today. Yeah, we're... yeah, yeah. sure. Come tomorrow. <laughs> and they'll start hiding things around. <laughs> yeah, sure. But I think if I had to put my finger on two things, one would be the standards, like, okay, you got to be ISO 9001. Oh, you got to be managing the performance of your suppliers. How do you do that? Oh, you need to audit them, et cetera, right? And another one is the IT systems. I think a lot of buyers, for example, you, you talk about traceability, right? So how do you trace this and, you know, that batch? When did you receive it? From which supplier, you know, and uh, this product corresponds to what incoming component batch and so on. This is very important, right? If you really want right. to to ensure consistent quality, because if you have an issue, then you can really go back and and, and study, investigate, and then understand sort of the cause and effect relationships. And if you have an issue, you know which products to isolate and retest, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, in worst case, for for a recall, right? You can really uh, recall just the, the the devices that that need to be recalled. So, but then. Then they turn around and they say, well, what's an efficient way to do that? Oh, there's something called the MES, right? Um, right. Manufacturing execution systems. Or it's part of cert- certain uh, ERP systems. Oh, okay, exactly. well, let's use these IT systems and let's um, let's just implement it. Let's just bake it into our processes or maybe the way they did is the other way around. Let's install right. it and sort of set up our processes around it <laughs> right but but this if you if these erp systems and a lot of them are pushing the companies to go in the right direction anyway uh so it's right. better that than, than nothing much better than nothing so just the fact that they implemented these it systems really gave them an edge and 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 pushed them and allowed them to to uh, to become much better right does that make sense? These two things. Um, Absolutely. I sh- these three things, I should say. The right. buyers pushing, teaching, charging back, etc. Yeah. Number two is the standards. And number three is the IT systems. Right. Absolutely. And and I think that there is probably a number four is where, you know, the, the original raw materials manufacturer, they really kind of figured out somehow how to you know, get the right raw materials and, and a lot of it because now they are mm. leaders on basically manufacturing uh, uh, components from raw materials, right? Uh, yeah. We talk about cap resi- resistors and the ceramic capacitors, ceramic resistors. I mean, a lot of these things really comes from 
right from the raw materials. And if you don't have the right ones mm. and you don't know how to pro- process that raw material properly, you're not going to get the, the right kind of, uh, for example, resistance or quality resistance. So I, I think that um, th- there was a lot of areas in terms of manufacturing that I wasn't involved directly in myself. But I, I do recall in another example, um, you know, five, 10 years later, and I go and I try to buy a watch somewhere. And those days, little by little, you couldn't buy mm. a counterfeit watch. And I actually had no idea that it was counterfeit. I thought it was just <laughs> a beautiful watch. And I said, how much is this? And uh, I was expecting him to say something like $20, $30, $40, just like last time. <clears throat> but he said 300 and I and I was shocked. Uh-huh. Uh, my <laughs> Chinese friend was with me. I said, "What's he talking about? Did he say three three hundred or thirty dollars?" He said, "No, I think he said three hundred. He asked, and the guy said, "No, definitely three hundred." I said, "What's the issue here? This is just another copy watch." He said, "No, <laughs> uh, must be something special about it because he's not budging." And I said, "Well, uh, I'm not gonna buy it. Let's go." He said, "Yeah, we start walking." And you know how that goes, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, the, we the, didn't hear. Suddenly, yeah. the guy runs after you. Is he? <laughs> right. Well, he did it. He didn't run back. And my friend said, are you sure you want this watch? Because he looks like he's not. He doesn't care if you leave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, yeah. I really do like it. Let's go get it. So I can't believe I actually dared those days. This is like 20 years <laughs> ago. And I actually paid three hundred dollars for that watch, thinking that oh my God, it's gonna be like dead in a month. And I was shocked that that watch showed. Uh, it, it became a talking point um, for five years. Uh, I almost used it for four and a half years with no problem. Little by little, uh, it was yeah. itching. You know, the band oh, yeah. was itching my wrist, but the yeah. watch itself never broke. Worked perfect, looked beautiful, mm-hmm. like that's new. So mm-hmm. one day I was at the uh, uh, Incheon Airport, you know, in Korea, mm-hmm. and I saw a watch shop, and I was wearing my watch. I said, you know, let me just go see what's going on. And as soon as I walked in, the guy said, "Oh, we have a watch exactly like yours." I said, "Really? I'd like to see it." And he showed me, and he, and then he said, "May I look at your watch?" I said, sure. And I had no idea why, but now I know he wanted to see if it's fake or real. And he looked right. and he said, wow, you have the good one. I said, uh, what do you mean? He said, it's exactly the same as ours. <laughs> 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 uh, I didn't quite get it, but I know now that he meant that it's real. So this watch was such an amazing copy or it was real, God knows. And right. he showed me the real watch. The real watch was fourteen thousand dollars. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> now that makes sense. Why it was three hundred dollars? But my yeah. point is that but I maybe really it was made by it. the same factory and sold. You know, uh, the, the third shift sort of uh, production, right? So maybe it's that all exactly possible. the same. Yeah. No, you, you're right. You never know. I don't do that anymore. By the way, I, you know, I think the whole thing is banned, or uh, I don't know what's happened. Uh, anyway, the point I was trying to make is that how can they at that time, if it was a copy, how can they actually do that? You know, so that means that there was a lot of progress going on, going around, uh, going on at the, let's say, in the background that really helped this whole process come together eventually. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, between you and I and uh, others from West who taught them how to run mm-hmm. the process they eventually got it and they were able to actually develop their own process and make it even better yeah 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 to get back to you mentioned point number four is the yes. the, the raw materials etc the way i see it is you know how first final assembly went there because the labor was so cheap and then over yes. time they they say well you know uh, they really wanted to they were very eager to invest and right. like it, that's the china the, the story of china's development right very high leverage uh, let's get into debt let's do all kinds of things let's let's invest because the future will be brighter so let's invest like crazy 
you know, let's right. buy these CNC machines in, you know, plastic injection mold, um, molding presses. And, and, right. and then over time, keep, um, keep, uh, keep doing more and more here, right? This yeah. has been the, 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 the crazy story of let's, let's do everything here. Let's stop buying from Taiwan, from uh, Korea, Japan, US, etc. Let's do more and more here. And it's sort of a power play, uh, right. obviously, because now, now it's very hard to relocate things because they've basically killed all of their competitors. You know, if you want to buy yeah, you know, the, most of the electronic components, it's, it's very hard to buy them out, you know, out, of, out of China. It's... Um, it's it's possible here and there if you take it into account very carefully when you design the product. But after that, once you've designed your product and, you, you know, you're thinking, well, maybe I've just changed some, you know, sources of components. I can find something equivalent. Right. I do a, you know, new validation and, 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 and go ahead with sort of the same version of the product. Well, in many cases, not possible. You need to yeah. really redesign the, the, the full product because you have the amount of, of choice you know the number of options is so much lower uh in in other countries so the way i see it is sort of a power play and where it's really evident is in the electric electric vehicle industry where you yes. they, they, they have what 80 percent of the refining capacity for um for the you know lithium and, and cadmium and, and, and whatever uh the the, the cobalt and the, the key um uh, the key raw materials and then yes. after that all, all of the, yeah, the, the the batteries obviously they, they're crushing uh, the rest of the world in terms of capacity it, it's this is clearly government policy it's really uh, irking the <laughs> the governments in in the US and, and now the European Union also and, right. uh, and, and, and some others I saw what uh, Brazil also and, and, and some others are um are adding tariffs well um is it unfair competition or is it just really really smart government policy that was really followed by nearly all of the actors we don't mm -hmm. know but anyway i think the eu commission came out with a very detailed uh, investigation report and everything and I, I think it's still the um intermediary investigation reports so they will come out maybe with something more detailed uh, they got some information from uh, byd and a few others that cooperated uh, you know, interesting topic but kind of uh, besides the, the the topic of the podcast today if we look back okay so the product got better but also one thing I, I think we should mention is that in many product categories Chinese suppliers want to have their own products so that instead of relying on a buyer that is all powerful and that will say, hey, here's the drawings, here's everything, you make it, you sign this contract first, we have leverage over you, we control the relationship. Instead of that, they want to be in control. They want to say, well, come to our showroom or you know, at the Kenton Fair or now it's more like Alibaba and so on. Here's right. our really nice samples. And then the example I always take is the coffee machine. You go to a coffee machine supplier and they have a showroom and you have, you know, dozens of models of coffee machines and say, well, this one has this feature, this feature, this is another kind of coffee machine like this, like this, and, you know, and different shapes, etc. And, oh, but we can make different color. Don't worry. Uh, it's just, you know, minimum of the quantity is a bit higher if you want right. your own color uh, because we need to inject, you know, with different uh, pigment, etc. Okay. And then in that case, the buyer comes and they're just a distributor. They are not, they're, they're buying ODM, right? Original design. Yeah, that's right. They're buying from an ODM. Um, so they're just a, just a distributor and the supplier can just cut them off and say, oh, well, no, now the, yeah. the market is for somebody else because your volumes were not great or because <laughs> exactly. you keep complaining about quality. You know, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but then once it's their own product, they, they sort of have an incentive for making it work in the marketplace. So they can't do some crap that will break, right? Because also they will lose their distributors. Uh, th does that make sense to you? Oh, my God. That that totally makes sense. And in fact, 
the scenario that you painted uh, is amazingly true. Uh, I remember a uh, long, long time ago, Walmart, who has been using a lot of Chinese products way, way back. But the Americans weren't buying it because they were looking at it like, oh, this is cheap, low quality. Well, Walmart opened 6,000 sh- uh, uh, 6, uh, what you would call stores in um, in China. Mm-hmm. So oh, they would yeah, act- big, yeah. 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 They would actually buy their own product and sell it to themselves with profits, which is amazing. And then once <laughs> the America's pub- public kind of started noticing yeah. and uh, picking up on that, Walmart noticed that, okay, American, American uh, market started picking up and American public are really suffering uh, for a monthly payment for their mortgage and they don't have much money left. So they go to Walmart a lot more often. And so because of that, they started actually doing a lot of drop shipping and, and basically taking these products from China directly to uh, stores in uh, Walmart in America. And now Walmart has over several thousand stores in America mm. and China and all around the world. And I honestly believe that if they cut off the relationship between China and uh, Walmart, Walmart will just suffer greatly because oh, Walmart, of Target, are... Amazon, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, 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 Amazon too. Oh. I agree. I agree. And and that goes back to what you said. Uh, you know, the buyers don't have much say anymore. Uh, even uh, I kind of worked short time in Walmart. They they just doodle with the price, but they get to a point where the you know supplier says no, can't do it. Buy it or or leave it. That's it. Take it or leave it. That's that's mm-hmm. the price. Yeah. And then so all they do is kind of change something in the product that uh, makes yeah. the product slightly unique. And mm-hmm. then they put a Walmart brand name on it and that becomes private uh, brand. <laughs> but they still they still run some validation testing, right? To see if the product will keep working. In, yeah, in they do. They, they, so they use uh, like uh, companies like Intertech in US to run... Yeah. Uh, product uh, testing on all products before they come in. So it's it's not a bad system. It works. Uh, but is it just uh, safety testing or also reliability? Um, it's really a combination depending on the product type. Some products, they have to do some minimal safety testing. Not very expensive <laughs> testing, just enough mm-hmm. to make sure that, you know, like, uh, for example, if something uh, a bracket you have to plug into the wall, they plug in, they... They kind of let it sit, use it for a month to make sure there's nothing burned. <laughs> and yeah, they put some very basic. On it and things like that, just basic tests. Yeah, uh, you okay. use a test. Uh, just and life, then, short life yeah. test, not even accelerated. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Nothing, nothing complicated. And, um, and, and they do the same thing for the gum, garments, shirts, dressers, I mean, wood, furniture. They yeah, do it for right. everything. Okay. Uh, it, it's not very costly i've been to one of those uh, intertech uh meetings and uh actual factory testing when they were doing all that uh it's not very complicated process they do right. not like we do the way we do for yeah, example yeah, yeah. testing it's more of an because, engineering evaluation and reliability testing but these guys don't do it like that yeah they just they just does a, on the buyer side product already developed just want to make sure it doesn't doesn't uh, crash and burn or, or something really terrible, right? And that's it. I think they work right. a lot with UL these days more than Intertech. Yeah. One thing I wanted to bring it up, uh, Renault, mm-hmm. I was wondering what you think. What products do you think that right now, at least category of products, that you think has shown a lot of liability improvement? I was thinking... Some consumer electronics, some appliances, and some oh, automotive. Definitely. Yes, yes. I had the same category escape to my mind. White goods in general got much better just because, yeah, the LG, Electrolux, and so on really taught them, and then they, they kind of did the same, right, even for their own brands or, or even if it's just OEM work. Uh, right. There's now a number of factories that have proper you know, reliability engineers uh, with a lab 
and quality engineers and some capable component suppliers. And all of that really, uh, re really ends up um, in, in, in better products, you know, that just makes sense. Consumer right. electronics, um, it depends, but those that are geared toward the, uh, the, the export market um, in, let's say, in Europe and, and, and North America, uh, probably if they are above a certain price point. Right? I would not, yeah, I would yeah, not I say would all say, of them. Or, <laughs> no, not all of them, but I would definitely say smartphones, right? Huawei and some others. Oh, yeah. Um, Oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, and maybe TVs. I, I do recall seeing yeah. a, a hundred fifty dollar TV in Walmart uh, when I was. That was like wow. That, that's mm. like you know, it, it, yeah. The, some of the products are just amazing. Uh, what about automotive recently? Yeah, well, um, obviously uh, they've been <laughs> that industry there has been growing by leaps and bounds. Yes. Um, so what everybody in the industry says is that they were not able to get as good as the, um, you know, Japanese and Western brands for internal combustion engine. So their whole strategy from 15 years ago was to leapfrog that and go directly into the next technology, which was electric vehicles. And to them, is you know, it seems like it's been so obvious, like, oh, everybody had landline phones and now they have mobile phones, you know, so this is going to be the same kind of idea. Let's jump to the next curve right? early. Let's make sure that there's no competition outside of China for the, for, for, for the batteries and for the key components and we'll be the king on the hill, you know, uh, so... There's like, I don't know, a hundred automotive brands now in China, you know, Chinese, uh, Chinese born, Chinese grown automotive brand is crazy. It's like right. every province has a few. It's, it's amazing. But the, yeah, the big ones like, uh, you know, BYD and Xpeng and Neo and, and whatever. Neo, yeah. uh, and, and, and a few others when it comes to, to uh, electric vehicles and some of them only make electric vehicles like uh, BYD, for example. Yeah, right. they they are pretty good. They are pretty good. I mean, BYD is is now uh, toe to toe with with Tesla, right? On the number of EVs sold, uh, but they have yeah they have tremendous experience. Uh, yeah. I remember in Shenzhen already what six seven years ago easily, right. they were making all the buses and all the all the taxis, all these blue taxis that replace the red taxis. Oh, made by BYD. I mean, and it's, that's just in Shenzhen, but then you have all the other cities um, and then you have a lot of other places in Southeast Asia, etc., where they exported the, the same kind of things. They have an yeah, amazing... Speaking of, um, speaking of BYD, uh, oh. when I was at, at, at Nokia and we went to do a um, uh, supplier audit, one of them was BYD, BYD and uh to be to be honest, it was just a small uh, manufacturing shop, and they were making just uh, batteries of all small, yeah, companies, small size yeah. batteries. Right. Yeah. At the beginning, that's how they started, right? But then they spun off, yeah, uh, BYD Electronics, right? Uh, which that's is now right. like a billion billion dollar um, electronic manufacturing um, uh, services supplier. In, uh, right. in Shenzhen, which is also huge, but their main company, their their um, automotive uh, division is really really killing it. Yeah, the automotive division just announced a, a basically a EV model uh, sports car. I think that is the fastest sports car in the world. Oh, um, possible that that's yeah. exactly the kind of things the you know the hard problems. Not really soft, but like we say, hard problems. It just takes a lot of engineering um, thinking and and a lot of experiments and so on, and with a very clear performance target that will get get people excited. That's exactly where the Chinese will uh, will excel. I mean, that that really sounds like something where they, they will be leaders. Yeah, that just makes sense. Yeah, but but I think you know, despite all this wonderful success, which I'm happy for them, but 
uh, there's still a lot of challenges, aren't they? Oh, that's for sure. I mean, um, first, as I mentioned earlier, there's a big sort of local market for very, very cheap, very shoddy products, um, you know, that, that will break pretty fast and so on, that just, I don't know, they look good when they're given as a gift with very expensive packaging or something like that, or they, they're just really, really cheap and people are happy with that and it will break very fast, right? So, so that is still there. That has not disappeared, okay? So buyers beware, right? There's right. still a mentality of, well, the, the regulations are for others, but we are smarter, so we'll just fabricate the... Um, uh, you know, the test reports and everything, the, 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 the right. data, and, or we'll just put a CE marking on, on, on the product, even though we don't even know what it means, what, right. what, what you know, and, and that's it. And then there's also, at the same time, um, and that's what makes it really, really uh, dangerous, a tendency of a lot of buyers to just close their eyes for it, actually asking for it. Like there's a lot of buyers, their business model is to sell crappy Chinese products everywhere in the world, right? And they want the products to be yeah. cheap and crappy. If they are better, better made with better components, et cetera, et cetera, with some engineering right. content that, you know, it makes them uh, differentiated and better and so on, they will not be able to sell to, to, to sell it because, yeah, because there's, there's a market for it everywhere. So this has not disappeared. And we will keep yeah. hearing yeah. about disasters, you know, about products made in China. Maybe forever right so well i was just thinking you know not to cut you off but i was thinking there are at least these challenges remaining right mm -hmm. for example mm -hmm. every at least western company con companies they want things fast they don't want like a uh, turnaround for a design oh, to yeah. take it right, right. They, they want it to be six months in some cases you and i have received some uh, orders right from uh clients from west they they just want something to be mm. done like six months or less uh, and, oh and and we know it's oh, yeah. not doable and so uh speed versus quality i think that's a challenge still for some chinese companies mm. uh, how, how do you you know hurry up and make it but still maintain high quality you know pressure on Fast turnaround, labor markets are, uh, are are increasing the cost of the labor, right? Increased cost mm -hmm. of labor is causing some issues with that. But I was thinking, okay, speed versus quality, that's one issue. How about in product quality? development, right? Yeah, in right. product development. We're not talking six months to produce something already developed, already industrialized, everything. We're talking six months to even get to uh, fully working prototypes, Correct. Um, validated for reliability, um, right. you know, pre-tested for compliance, et cetera, et cetera. And then right. getting to right. Right. fabricating the tooling and doing the pre-production pilot runs and starting small in mass production and scaling up and so on. That takes time. And the more unique and complex, you know, innovative the, the, the products, uh, the more different uh, parts and technologies that need to be integrated in a way that was never integrated before and so on. You know, for a totally new application, yeah, that you know, the more innovative, the more the more special, the longer it takes. Um, and and that's some... what you and I see, and right, we are seeing a lot of customers come to us complaining. Oh, we had oh, this yeah. other Chinese company manufacturing, but they produced crap. And we say, well, when did you start? Oh, we started mm. like uh, six months ago. Well, no wonder. You, you push them so hard that they basically wanted to make it really quick and they uh, they had shortcomings in quality. Yeah, sometimes the buyer pushed and said, well, you're going to get the business if you can make it you know, within six months because that's the deadline. And then, right. then the suppliers like, well, you know, let's try. Let's try to get the business. But also sometimes the buyer says, well, you know, this is what we need to do, et cetera. And then the Chinese supplier doesn't run a feasibility study, doesn't really uh, get, you know, their engineers and purchasers and everybody and manufacturing people around the table to ask them, okay, guys, what do you think about this? What kind of issues do you think in this this uh, this product design? What could go wrong, etc.? They just say, well, uh, okay, you know, tell them, um, you know, we charge whatever, $10,000 and then 
get into tooling and and production you know and i will get them a prototype and they they are over optimistic you know that's a very very typical characteristic of immature chinese manufacturing companies so right. they, they they assume that everything will go well at every step of the process but when you develop a new product that's exactly the wrong mindset so yeah, yeah. yeah that's very typical very typical and that ends up in a uh, yeah a poorly made unreliable product um, right more often than not for sure and another thing i was thinking uh, the challenge for them probably a lot more challenging or less challenging for West, but more challenging for Chinese companies is the brand differentiation. You know, when, when they, mm. for example, BYD is now making great products, but does anybody buy it from us yet or, or West? Because I think there is that brand or tarnished image of a cheap quality coming from China is preventing the perception oh, yeah. is preventing people from even trying. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I, I get that. A lot of people just think, Oh, this is from China. This is crap. Uh, again, the image has changed a bit because everybody knows the iPhones are made in China. Right. And oh, some, right. some really, some really high quality products, high reliability products are made in China. So where it's made is not really what's important. What I keep explaining to people is that it's not who you work with, it's also how you work with them and how involved you are and what 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 parts of the validation and testing and everything that you know and design reviews, etc. you do versus you just rely on the manufacturer. That makes a huge difference. So uh yeah, the it it, it, it could change the way that you know, the, the stigma of made in Japan products from the, the 1950s, it was, right. oh, that's really cheap products, right? And then by the, the end of the 80s, it was, wow, these guys are overtaking us. They're they great. They're doing a lot of great products. They're very innovative. They are better, you know, they're, they're better, cheaper, you know, their manufacturing capabilities right. are much, much better and so on, right? But it, again, just because there's such a huge, market you know such a huge um 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 yeah i would call it just the local cheap market right but it's not just local because there's a lot of overseas buyers also looking for crappy products there's so many crappy manufacturers still that right. it will take time for made in china overall to to gain traction however there's some brands like my dear like yeah like byd uh, in europe i see them you know, advertising, having dealerships, etc., and and uh, and people buy a lot from them, and they right. don't mind. You know, and there's there's a few others like what I agree. Yeah, a lot of them in white goods, sort of um, uh, electrical home appliances. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes, because right. anyway, right. people think anyway everything is made there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, another challenge that I see that is definitely a problem. Well, it was a bigger problem before mm. intellectual, you know, IP pro- property, right? Intellectual mm. property IP. Um, you know, a lot of uh, counterfeits, a lot of uh, or or lack of uh, domestic innovation. Yes. This is like, um, you know, we I rem- I remember when we traveled to China, we had to kind of be like the watchdog watching how yeah. they are doing and as soon as they messed it up we had to correct it and we had to train them and it was great because if you train them they will do exactly what you told them but if at the time anyway uh, if there was some issues in the process that we didn't know about mm. they didn't innovate they didn't create a solution that's right uh, without us telling them or asking about and and I'm hoping that that's all changing, of course. Uh, but I think probably there's so little bit challenge there. Yes, actually, we talked about it a few episodes ago with Dan Harris, the very experienced uh, lawyer. And yet the way he said it is, it got better. And for certain things like allowing anybody to register a trademark and things like that. Even the Chinese government themselves get so um, ashamed of what, what what some of the the companies were doing that they they uh, they pass some laws, you know, to 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 make things better. Uh, and obviously, there's a lot of pressure from um, from 
from some some other countries, and that was front and center in uh, Trump's negotiation in what 20, uh, 2017, 2018, right, uh, leading to the to the tariffs and so on. Yeah, better better protection of of, of IP uh, of of American companies. So yeah, things have been changing, but of course that's that's an issue. And as long as they don't change that, a lot of people say, "Well, it's, you know, it's from China. It's probably some some copy of you know of a, a proper brand." That's right. Now, whatever the government does, there's certain things that will keep going, right? There's there's so many companies, especially around Shenzhen, that you know Chinese companies that say, "Oh, okay, this is working well in Amazon, and it's retailing there for whatever forty bucks. We can simplify it." Make it cheap, and then drop ship it directly from China, and you know it's going to look more or less the same, but simplified. So they cannot say that it's a straight copy, um, but it's going to be exactly the same keywords and everything. We just compete with them in Amazon. Uh, people will look at ours and they will understand that it's really the same as theirs because even the way will I don't know the colors of the buttons and things like that will uh, right. look kind of like the original product, you know. And instead of um, fifty bucks that it's retailing, we'll we'll set it for thirty or twenty five. You know, we'll just steal the market from under them. You know, we'll do ninety percent of the sales and we'll be happy. And right. if they go out of business, maybe we'll do another version a bit more pricey to uh, <laughs> to capture, you know, the rest of the yeah. market. Right. That is definitely at, at at play, and there's a lot of products. I was listening to someone uh, in the U.S. testifying uh, in front of Congress. I think she was from the CPSC or yes. um, uh, some some uh, product safety uh, agency. And she was saying there's so many issues with that in the toy categories. It's crazy. There's a lot of unsafe toys. Oh, yeah. That are just distributed by Amazon, you know, developed really quick and cheap by Chinese suppliers, copy some existing brands, but not exactly the same. Right. Don't do risk assessment. Don't do proper, you know, testing and reviews and everything. Just set it, you know, dump it in, in the U.S. market and not just the U.S. market. It's also in Europe. Um, right. So this will not stop. And as long as we have some of these, again, the sort of brand image of made in China products will not be great. <laughs> do, do you agree with oh, that? Yeah. I totally agree. And I think that you you brought another good point: um, tariffs by Trump, and that kind of takes me to my last challenges I think they they will have in terms of the recent geopolitical issues that are impacting their labor force, mm. their um, costs of living, right? Cost of manufacturing. Um, and how is that? All, all of this issues that threats are happening is going to affect the reliability and quality is it going to be a challenge for them? I'm wondering if we're going to see reduction or or same or decrease in the quality of uh, continuous, you know, improvement. I'm not sure where it's this how this is going to impact them. And then, mm-hmm. of course, as you know, because of the tariffs, a lot of the products are moving to India and and Vietnam and some other countries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, and uh, but they're still developed. You know, if it's if it's again ODM Chinese suppliers, they still do the development in China, and they would right. probably send the um, opponents from China. So I don't think that will lead to major major differences. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe a little drop, yeah, maybe a little drop in quality just because of the lack of experience in the the workers and the inspectors. Yeah, right. right. But that uh, that that that's not the development we 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 need to um, to keep looking at. That's an interesting topic. Uh, but I think we're kind of out of time, so let's uh, yeah. let let let's close here. Yeah, just so if we just summarize, uh, the key things that really helped uh, these suppliers were a combination of the the pressure and teaching of their buyers, um, the international standards that just gave them sort of a roadmap. If you do this, 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 then. It'll right. be a, an approved supplier, but also it pushes them to improve their systems and processes. Um, the IT systems, uh, ERPs, MES systems, etc., yes. that um, 
just allowed them without much managerial effort to really improve their uh, their systems and processes again right um all of the investment in automated equipment and going up the supply chain and having the whole supply chain really close to them so that it's very easy to to follow up and, and check what's going on and 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 so on um and and and, and these are probably the the key uh, the key factors so um yeah th- thanks a lot andrew that was that was an interesting one i hope the, the listeners found it interesting and yeah we'll Absol- talk again yeah <laughs> we'll talk again soon and thanks to the listeners and you will hear from us next week as usual Thanks again for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Sophies Group. We're on a mission to provide you with everything you need to manufacture effectively in Asia, including inspections, auditing, new product development support, contract manufacturing, 3PL warehousing and fulfillment, and much, much more across Asia's key manufacturing areas. Visit us at sofeast.com. That's S-O-F-E-A-S-T dot com to learn more and get help. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please do rate, review and share because it will really help others discover us too.